Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome this morning to our service here at Gatehouse Community Church. And whether you're a visitor or one of our regulars, we pray this morning the Lord will bring a special blessing upon each and every one of us. We've had um, a week that's been fairly mixed, really, joy and sadness together. Our, our brother in Christ, Kevin, has gone to be with the Lord, and that's great, for, uh, great and joy for him, but it's, of course, sadness for us as we and his family shall miss him. So we shall start the service as I know Kevin would want, and that's with prayer. Let's pray to the Lord. Our Heavenly Father, this morning as we, we come to you, Lord, we remember all the things that Kevin had done with this church. Lord, we remember and we thank you for him, and we praise you that he is with you. We praise you for that wonderful hope that we have that we can be with you in glory. Yeah. And this morning, Lord, we just pray that you'll take charge of everything that happens here. Lord, that you'll help us put aside those worries. You'll help us put aside all those thoughts that may be on our mind and stopping yeah. us from getting really close to you. We pray this morning, Lord, that we'll hear your word clear. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We read uh, in Isaiah these words. For thus says the High and Exalted One, who lives forever, whose name is Holy. I dwell on a high and holy place, and also with the contrite and lowly of spirit, in order to revive the spirit of the lowly, and to revive the heart of the contrite. And one called out to another and said, Holy, 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 is the Lord of hosts. The whole world is full of his glory. Let's stand and sing together that hymn, Holy, Holy, Holy.
have a holy God. And we read earlier from Isaiah in the Old Testament, and then in the New Testament, in Revelation, we read, and the four living creatures, each one of them having six wings, and full of eyes around and within, and day and night they do not cease to say, holy, holy is the Lord God, the Almighty, who was and is and who is to come. And so, Lord, this morning, Lord, we praise you. We praise you that you were there at the beginning, that you're with us now, and that you'll be there in the future too. You are the Alpha and Omega. Let's sing together. justified through faith. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into the grace in which we now stand. And we boast in the hope of glory of God. And in Colossians, for he has rescued us from the kingdom of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his dear Son. Oh, holy God, Lord, you give us life. You are the strength in our lives. You're the wind in our sails. You are the very breath in our lungs. Great are you, Lord, 
noticing. Jesus, we, we pour out our praise to you this morning. And we pray that 
as we offer you this a living sacrifice of praise that all that we offer is acceptable to you lord come into our hearts fill us afresh we pray help us to hear every word that you speak to us through pastor chris and anoint him this morning we pray in jesus name amen, amen. please take a seat us in our worship this morning and thank you to all those who contributed to that it's lovely that we have this library of pre-recorded praise that we can use for these services and um, I, I think you will agree that although it's not quite what we're used to it's still um, lovely just to join together in praise and worship as um, Ernie has already mentioned, I think most of you will already have heard that Kevin passed peacefully away in his sleep on Monday. He'd been in hospital the previous week, but then came home and died at home. Kevin still felt a little unwell last Sunday, so joined us online and was even interacting with us on the live stream was a devoted Bible-believing Christian and a member of this church family right to the end. I've known Kevin for about 30 years since he first moved to Kukubri, and despite the suffering that he experienced, much of it as a result of heavy physical work in the days before health and safety at work was taken more seriously, I seldom ever heard him complain about anything. In fact, he was a great intercessor who would spend hours praying for others, but would rarely request prayer for himself. And I asked him, if I asked him how he was, he usually would just respond with a wee gesture of his hand and say, so, so. I had asked Malcolm to share a bit this morning, but unfortunately Malcolm and all his family are at home isolating because Ben has picked up COVID. They've had their PCR results through and they're okay, but um, Malcolm, Hilary, Grace and Roseanne all felt that it was wise not to come along this morning. But I hope that next Sunday, Malcolm can share with you a little bit more of what a significant part Kevin played in the founding of this church. In the meantime, let's just pause for a few moments and keep silence in respect of Kevin's memory. Father, we just commit him to your loving care. I'm going to read now from um, the second letter of Paul to Timothy, chapter 1, and I'm going to start at verse 1. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, in keeping with the promise of life that is in Christ Jesus, to Timothy, my dear son, grace mercy and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. I thank God whom I serve as my ancestors did with a clear conscience as night and day I constantly remember you in my prayers. Recalling your tears I long to see you so that I may be filled with joy. I am reminded of your sincere faith, which first lived in your grandmother, Lois, and in your mother, Eunice, and I am persuaded now lives also in you. 
For this reason, I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For the spirit God gave us does not make us timid, but gives us power, love and self-discipline. So do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord or of me, his prisoner. Rather, join with me in suffering for the gospel by the power of God. He has saved us and called us to a holy life, not because of anything we have done, but because of his own purpose and grace. This grace was given us in Christ Jesus before the beginning of time, but it has now been revealed through the appearing of our Saviour, Christ Jesus, who has destroyed death and has brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. And of this gospel, I was appointed a herald and an apostle and a teacher. That is why I am suffering as I am. Yet this is no cause for shame, because I know whom I have believed and am convinced that he is able to guard what I have entrusted to him until that day. What you heard from me, keep as the pattern of sound teaching with faith and love in Christ Jesus. Guard the good deposit that was entrusted to you. Guard it with the help of the Holy Spirit who lives in us. Through the summer we've looked at a number of men and women of the Bible. They were parents and we've considered what we can learn from them as to some extent or other we all play the part of children or parents in God's family, either here in Gatehouse or in your own churches, wherever you come from. We've seen too how, however long or short their lives, each one of them left us a legacy as they all played a vital part in God's big salvation plan for all humanity. First, we looked at Noah, a man who is described as a just man and perfect in his generations, who was chosen by God to save his whole family from the consequences of the world's rapid decline after the fall. Then we saw how Abraham's faith was proved through an incredible act of obedience, which also demonstrated his son's trust in his dad's unshakable faith and foreshadowed the sacrifice God would one day make of his own son, Jesus, for the sake of all humanity. Next, we looked at Jacob, a complicated man who grew up in an atmosphere of sibling rivalry and favoritism, which he perpetuated in his own parenting style. He was a dab hand at deception too, but he eventually came clean with God and experienced his abundant grace and mercy. And his sons gave birth to the 12 tribes of Israel from whom we can trace Jesus' ancestry. Then we looked at some mums. First, Jochebed, the mother of Moses, Aaron and Miriam, who learned to let go and let God, leading to Moses becoming the man who would lead his people out of captivity, foreshadowing our salvation in Jesus. Then Naomi, a mum, mum-in-law and widow, whose bitterness in grief was turned to joy through God's provision of a husband and kinsman redeemer for her daughter-in-law, Ruth. And we saw that this foreshadowed the way Jesus would one day redeem all who believe and trust in him from the slavery of sin and death. Ernie spoke about Hannah, who yearned and prayed for her son so much that when God granted her request, she offered him up for God's service. We saw too that this miraculous birth foreshadowed the birth of Jesus and Mary's Magnificat prayer reflected Hannah's prayer of thanksgiving for her baby Samuel. And over the last couple of weeks, we looked at Mary and Joseph, who like all the others were just ordinary people who as Romans 8:28 to 30 reminds us, were called according to God's purpose, foreknown, 
and predestined to play their part in his kingdom purpose and contribute massively to Jesus' preparation for his earthly ministry with the real life experience that equipped him so well to connect with people and to communicate the love of his heavenly father. Today, we come to the last parent in this summer series, and her name is Eunice. And although we don't know a lot about her, we do know that both she and her own mother, Lois, gave Timothy the best legacy that any parent or grandparent can possibly give to any child. Mentioning no names, a couple of weeks ago, all those parents who had left it until the last minute were rushing around buying school shoes, clothes and stationery supplies. Anybody recognise themselves? <laughs> this week's Galloway News was full of its annual offering of back to school photos. And last week it was Facebook which was packed with all those first day photos. Yes, the new term is well underway. And soon we'll see our older young people heading off to uni after the long summer break. Some, like Jazz, are entering their final honours year. And others, like Clarice, will be heading off for the first time for their freshers week. Education is a crucial part of any child's upbringing and preparation for life. And we attach great importance to these academic milestones. But as we've been seeing through this series, parents play an even more critical role in establishing the foundations of faith which prepare their children for the life ahead of them. And as Proverbs 22, 6 reminds us, train a child in the way they should go, and when they are old, they will not turn from it. That's surely why Jesus ended his Sermon on the Mount by contrasting the builders of two houses, one built on sand and one on strong, rocky foundations. Eunice seems to me to be somebody who understood what he was talking about. She wouldn't have ever met or heard Jesus personally, but she would have heard so much about what he taught, and that must surely have included the story of these two builders with its strong message that whoever hears his words and puts them into practice is like the wise man who built his house on the rock. Eunice and her mum Lois must have made a pretty good job of passing this all on to Timothy. Not only are, the, are two of the epistles of the New Testament addressed to him personally, but his greetings are included in six of Paul's other epistles. So although we don't know much about Eunice, we too are able to enjoy her legacy as a parent through her son. The first time we come across Eunice is in Acts 16. When Paul arrived at Lystra during his second missionary journey, probably around about AD 50. Like all the places we visited during our last series on the seven churches, Lystra was in modern day Turkey. And some of you may even recognize this little bit of coastline. Act 16 doesn't mention Eunice by name, but verses one to three tell us that Paul came to Derby and then to Lystra where a disciple named Timothy lived, whose mother was Jewish and a believer, but whose father was Greek. The believers at Lystra and Iconium spoke well of him. Paul wanted to take him along on the journey. Something about Timothy impressed people, and it impressed Paul too. And that was made clear in verse five of our reading where Paul wrote, I am reminded of your sincere faith, which first lived in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice. And I am persuaded now lives in you also. Other people you know, who when you meet them, you can't help but think of their parents or grandparents. 
and the influence that they had on their lives. We spoke about that last week, didn't we? When we recalled that people in Nazareth immediately identified Jesus with his dad. In this great movement of assemblies of God to which we belong, I've often been struck by the number of pastors who have followed in the footsteps of their parents. And some of you will recall that on Pentecost Sunday, our national leader, Glynn, spoke of the part his own father played in his Christian upbringing. And Campbell shared with me only yesterday an obituary published following his grandfather's death in 1950. A man described as yielding his heart to the Lord at the age of 13. But what jumped out at me was the description of his very happy home life where he and his wife dispensed generous hospitality generous hospitality to the Lord's people. Does that remind you by any chance of another couple? Do you see what I mean about passing on a legacy? My Christian upbringing was in a very different tradition to the one in which I now belong, but was formative in the way it ensured that even when I left home and was on my own as a teenager in London, it was the most natural thing in the world to seek fellowship with other Christians. My parents' legacy of regular church attendance prepared the way for a very mixed up and disaffected teenager to respond to God's call on my life. And as Paul the Apostle wrote to Timothy, it was his mother and his grandmother too who came straight to mind. We know that they were from Lystra, and if we backtrack to an earlier visit there by Paul during his first missionary journey, you might remember from Acts 14 that things were pretty, went pretty pear-shaped for Paul. Verses 19 and 20 say that some Jews came from Antioch and Iconium and won the crowd over. They stoned Paul and dragged him outside the city, thinking he was dead. But after the disciples had gathered around him, he got up and went back into the city. We can only speculate, but I can't help wondering if Lewis and Eunice were among those disciples who came to Paul's assistance. If they were among those first responders, that really would have made a lasting impression upon him. Some things we do know for sure about Eunice are that although she was a Jewish woman, she was married to a Greek. Also that she had converted to Christianity, although apparently her unnamed husband didn't believe in either faith. Just as today it's likely that such a mixed marriage was difficult and prone to tension. But something else we know from 2 Timothy 3.15 is that despite her husband's lack of faith, Eunice brought Timothy up to know scripture and to understand its importance. It would seem that even in a place where there may have been some tension over this, he had been taught well by Eunice and her mum. In fact, Paul knew that they had taught him so well that according to the previous verse, he had become convinced of the truth of God's promised saviour, Jesus. The other Christians living in Lystra didn't know, just know Timothy. They knew his mum and grandmother too and couldn't think of a better equipped person than Timothy to accompany Paul on his continuing missionary travels. Timothy was well grounded in his knowledge of scripture and he was a convinced believer in Jesus as the saviour who had been so long promised and foreshadowed by the other biblical parents that we've been studying. Yes, just like us, he was probably taught the stories of Noah, Abraham, Jacob, Jochebed, Naomi and Hannah. He surely understood how Noah's Ark and the Passover foreshadowed Jesus and his work on the cross. Surely Timothy and Eunice understood that all these ancient events in their Jewish and Christian heritage foreshadowed what was happening now and that Paul's conversion 
and missionary journeys were part of the fulfillment of God's promise to Abraham that all peoples on earth would be blessed through him. They would surely have been excited and encouraged too as they realized that this was part of the fulfillment of God's promise to Jacob as the father of many nations. So Eunice was prepared to let her young son travel with Paul despite understanding this would expose him to danger. She would surely have prayed about this and quite possibly realized the truth of what Paul said to Timothy in this morning's reading. Traveling with Paul was anything but a guarantee of personal safety. But just like Jochebed, Eunice was willing to let go and let God. She knew her young son was as ready for this as he would ever be. She knew he'd learned well. And that as Paul wrote later in that same letter in 2 Timothy 3, 14 to 15, her son would continue in what he had learned and become convinced of because he knew those from whom he had learned it and how from infancy he had known the Holy Scriptures, which were able to make him wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. The perfect foundations Eunice established were a legacy which prepared Timothy for the really significant ministry which involved him and Paul traveling together for almost 15 years, spreading the gospel of Jesus across most of the Roman Empire. And unlike the way the Jewish faith had become, this was an inclusive gospel which they shared irrespective of race or nationality, religious upbringing, political belief, social status or gender. And as they traveled, Timothy did exactly what Eunice did for him. He taught and trained more disciples in the foundations of the Christian faith, helping them make sense of the Old Testament prophecies and how these had been fulfilled in Jesus. And as he did so, there was a cascade effect as he prepared more and more people to teach and train others, all part of the legacy of Eunice and her mum. It's a legacy that we all need to receive and embrace. We live in a world that needs to hear the good news more than ever. It's the kind of news that gave people then hope in the midst of utter despair. Those words of today's reading from Paul's second letter to Timothy were written from a prison in Rome, where Paul was in effect on death row. The letters that Paul wrote, many as we've seen actually written in Timothy's company, were all written for the same purpose. God had revealed to Paul the fulfillment of the Old Testament prophecies in the ministry, death and resurrection of Jesus. And Paul was determined that everyone possible should know the truth of this. Little did he know that we would still be referring to it 2,000 years later. At that time, one of the main challenges facing the church was persecution. And in the verses preceding the ones I read there from 2 Timothy, in chapter 3, verses 12 to 13, Paul wrote that everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted while evildoers and impostors will go from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. So he knew how vital it was that Timothy held on to the things that Eunice had taught him because he would face similar persecution under the Roman Empire's evil regime. These are things that I really, really pray Christians in Afghanistan are holding on to right now as they brace themselves for the almost inevitable persecution they'll soon be facing, if not already. Not only did Paul know that Jesus, what Jesus had said about persecution going with the territory, he also knew that Jesus had promised to return, but that before he did so, 
Before he did so, so many adverse situations would confront humanity, which would act as signs of his imminent return. I've said before that this included so-called pestilences or pandemics. And news this week seems to confirm that despite all the knowledge we have now of COVID, despite the vaccination program, it really is here to stay. And if nothing else, we should surely sit up and pay attention because it is surely one of the many signs of the times. Most of us, like Timothy, understand Jesus' command to be ready for his return. We know we need to be ready and that whatever happens, we have the certain hope of eternity ahead of us. But we must recognize, as Paul urged Timothy, the things that can so easily deceive and lull us into a false sense of security. So as Paul languished in prison, there was added impetus in his plea to Timothy to hold on to the things that he would be well prepared for whatever happened. How well are you holding on to these things? How well are you holding on to God's truth? When I heard the news on Monday that Kevin had gone to be with the Lord, my thoughts went straight to the certainty of the salvation that he knew he had in Jesus. Kevin knew he was unlikely to see old age, but never wanted anyone to worry about that because he held on to the truth that he knew. He had total confidence in God's promises and he's left us that as his legacy. Kevin knew the true meaning of Romans 8.35. Can anything ever separate us from Christ's love? Does it mean he no longer loves us if we have trouble or calamity? or are persecuted, or hungry, or destitute, or in danger, or threatened with death? Does it mean he no longer loves us if we suffer from spondylitis, constant pain, sleep apnea, diabetes, and depression? No. And Kevin knew very, very well that nothing would ever separate him from God's love. That's the lasting legacy that was sown into Kevin's life. And it's a lasting legacy that Timothy's mother established in Timothy. One that gave him a proper perspective on his life and helped him to look forward to the next. All who are parents or who have any kind of influence on children, whether as a relative, carer, teacher or member of a church family and it's lovely by the way to welcome people from other church families to join us this morning we all need to think of how our legacy will prepare others for the very real difficulties and challenges that they will face in this world we can't honestly claim to be a persecuted church in this nation right now but we are certainly a numerically diminished and sidelined church in an increasingly godless nation which confronts everyone with so much that is opposed to God. So just as then, there is no better legacy for us to leave than the legacy left by Eunice and Lois. And as Paul urged Timothy in verse 14 of today's reading, we all need to guard the good deposit that is entrusted to us, to guard it with the help of the Holy Spirit who lives in us. Amen. Shall we pray? Oh, Father God, we just thank you for the legacy of these men and women of scripture who were not just parents but people of faith who knew something of you and your truth which we can learn from which we can embrace as part of our faith 
we thank you for their example. And we thank you this morning for the example of Eunice and Lois and what they sowed into the, to Timothy's life. That he was able to respond to his call. And to go where you called him. Father, we thank you for the legacy of those who've sown into our lives. Just take a moment to think of who it was that first brought you to the Lord. And who it is that, who are the people that have really sown into your life? Just in your heart, give the Lord thanks for them. Father God, we pray that we would be able to sow a similar legacy into the lives of others. That we would not be ashamed to proclaim our Saviour Jesus. That we would always be ready to share the reason for our hope. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Shall we just continue in our, uh, an attitude of prayer? I'd like to just pray for a number of things, starting with um, praying for Kevin's family. Father God, your word promises that you are near to all who call on you, to all who call on you in truth. We thank you for our brother Kevin, who is now at peace in the place you have prepared for him. And we thank you for the assurance that your Son, our Saviour, Jesus, gave us that your will is for everyone who looks to him and believes to have eternal life and to be raised up at the last day. We pray, Father God, that all Kevin's family and loved ones would be comforted and encouraged by this truth as they grieve their loss, sure in a knowledge that you are the one who will one day wipe away every tear from their eyes. Father, we are mindful of the appalling situation in Afghanistan where so many live in fear of this new regime. We thank you that so many people have been helped to escape, but pray for those left behind. Father, we pray that those with the means to help them won't give up, but will continue in every effort to bring all those to safety who yearn to escape. Strengthen your church in Afghanistan, Father God. We pray you would send your angels to protect your people from injustice and help them to stand firm and to reach out with Christian love to all who suffer under this evil regime. We pray that every lie and trick of the enemy would be bound in Jesus' name. That no weapon raised to harm your church would succeed and that your truth and love would prosper. Father, we pray that according to your word, your people would be protected from fear and discouragement and would stand firm and know that the battle is yours, that you are with them. Merciful Father, we place into your care all the refugees and migrants. We know that in your love, you hurt with them. And we pour out our hearts to you this morning with sadness and a sense of helplessness for those who suffer. And we pray for those across the world who are suffering too from COVID, especially those who don't have the access we have to vaccinations and testing and hospital care. We pray for governments and all organizations that they would succeed in getting help where it's needed. And Father, we pray for our own area and nation. Help us, Father, to maintain a proper sense of responsibility, and to remain calm and ignore rumours and false information. Help us to be aware of those who are struggling, feeling weak or fearful, and to be ready to help and support. We pray for Ben, who has COVID, for full recovery and no lasting effects. 
and for the rest of the McPhersons and for Hillary as they await their results. And Father God, if there are things you want us as a church and nation to learn and understand through this pandemic about you and your will, we pray that you would give us the ears to hear and hearts to respond. We pray also for Shaz, who has been, had several seizures in the last few days and is feeling worn down by them all. And I pray for my wife, Alison, who's suffering from really quite severe back pain and headache today. We pray, Father God, for healing and full restoration of health. We pray for others known to us at this time who are in need of our prayers. And we pray all these things in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. And we're going to sing our last song it's because he lives
And we thank you, Lord, that all fear is gone, all those who put their faith in you. There is no fear because you are with us always. And you're the same yesterday, today and forever. And Lord, we praise you and we thank you for that. And we thank you for this morning, for all we've heard. And we thank you that we can come together wherever we might be as one family together, praising and worshipping you. And now let's say the grace together. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen.